So good evening. Good to see you all here at six o'clock. Uh, uh, Philip is out, so uh, he's asked me to step in, and happy to do that. Uh, we're going to continue on with the the uh, the theme or the series of uh, the minor prophets. Just a few things. Uh, uh, Mary uh, Nanny wanted me to put this out, or at least put some out over there. It's um, things you can hand out. Uh, the, the mobile dental bus is going to be at our property uh, in April. Um, there's a pre-screening day on the 1st. If you know someone who can't afford uh, dental uh, care and that has a, a need, maybe a sore tooth or something, um, usually all they do is extractions. They do some fillings, but... Um, if you know someone, please take one of these and give it to them so that they're, they'll be aware and they can um, take advantage of what's being offered here in, um, in, our, in our area. We're also needing someone to, uh, on Wednesdays, uh, Dave is involved with this, but we have a, a ladies, our Hispanic minister has some ladies, a Bible study that takes place at about 4 o'clock. Is that right, Dave? Sometime around then? 4 or 4.30? 4.30, thank you, 4.30. And um, uh, we've got the teaching covered, but they need an extra person to just kind of sit there and kind of uh, corral them, if you will. <laughs> and so if you'd be interested in doing that, uh, get a hold of Mary. Uh, I know David helps some, and uh, I know they just need to, uh, if you can help, it, it doesn't have to be necessarily every week, but just give Dave some some. Uh, uh, give them a break. So anyway, if that would interest you and you could invest uh, a couple afternoons, uh, an hour or two on Wednesdays um, a month, that would be great to see Mary Nanny, and I'm sure she would love to talk with you. Uh, so anything else? Do you have anything? Okay. Well, then let's open with a word of prayer, and then we'll get going, all right? God, thank you for this time that you've given us. Thank you for this evening. We have Bible studies and uh, across this campus, and I'm so thankful, Lord, that um, we can offer that and that folks come uh, from small to old, from uh, from all shapes and sizes and all ages, Lord. Um, there are folks across this campus learning more about Jesus. So I pray for the children, that they would, as they're um, young, that they would learn about Jesus, that they would memorize verses. They would have fun singing praise music and uh, enjoying games together. And God, I just pray that you'd bless that. And We have some young people meeting across the street. We pray, Lord, your hand be involved uh, with them, that they would be challenged in their walk, and that they would um, also hear about uh, Christ and his love for them. We have some adult Bible studies in here tonight, Lord. Um, I pray that you would speak to us as adults, that we would learn and enhance our knowledge of who you are and your love for us, that we would go beyond that and that what we learn would change our, our hearts to be more bent towards Christ, that we would leave this campus tonight uh, with, uh, in, in, a, in a deeper love with you. And so, God, we just lift all that's going up on, not only in this campus, but across the city and county. I pray your hand would be upon folks and, and folks would, uh, would come to Christ and would grow in their faith with him. So, God, um, have your will. We pray it all in Christ's name. Amen. Alan, would you lead us tonight? Sure. Well, it's good to see you. And, uh, I'm glad you're here. Help me sing tonight. You know, every once in a while, it's, it's a good thing, I believe, to get a fresh perspective on a familiar verse. And here's what I mean by that. Most, many of us in here know when I say Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, you know exactly what passage I'm talking about, those two verses. But today I thought, you know, I want to share that tonight because it really fits in. It, it helps to introduce the songs we'll be singing tonight. But I just, I, I'm living out on the edge. And so I, I got this from the Good News Bible, okay? I'm not saying that that's what you ought to use for your study. I don't think it is. But it does give a nice, fresh perspective on these verses. This is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Never rely on what you think you know. Remember the Lord in everything you do, and He will show you the right way. Alright? And that's very true. So let's sing about having faith in God and trusting Him on the mountaintops and in the valleys of life. Have faith in God when your pathway is lonely. He sees and goes all the way you have trod. Never alone are the least of His
So we're going to continue on uh, with Philip's uh, series, and tonight we're going to look at Habakkuk. You know, I'm thankful for modern software for pastors. I use, and Philip uses Logos. It's a great tool. You can open up all kinds of commentaries. You have a vast amount of information and books and, and studies at your fingertips, and it really helps you as you study and prepare. So glad for that. And I've heard the, the name of this prophet in various ways, but according to my software, which offers, uh, you know, that, that we're looking at tonight, Habakkuk, uh, in the Greek and in the Hebrew, and when there are words there, you can click on them, and it pronounces the word. So it helps you understand how to uh, pronounce the words. And in Hebrew, Habakkuk is, is pronounced Habak Habakkuk, Habakkuk. Uh, I knew I was going to mess it up, and I did there. I had to say it twice. Habakkuk, okay? That U is, that last U is kind of is, uh, long. I think that's how you say it, long, right? Uh, anyway, now I may go back and forth on how I pronounce it, you know, uh, as I go through this, but, uh, you know, hey, deal with it, okay? It's, it's Habakkuk, okay? All right. He is uh, self-identified as a prophet, um, uh, verse 1 tells us uh, the book is about him. Uh, he wrote it. The first thing that we notice is that this book is an oracle. 
Now, an oracle is uh, a prophetic speech. Um, it is a, a threatening or a menacing character, and it was often spoken against the nations. And further, we see that this prophet, Habakkuk, the majority of his, of his writings in, in Habakkuk here is a prayer. Additionally, the third chapter is not only a prayer, but it is a song. Now, it could have been um, a, a passionate song, rapid changes in rhythm and, and, and uh, context and all that. It could have been a dirge, as I've read. Now, Alan knows what a dirge is. Does everybody know what a dirge is? A dirge? I think it comes from medieval times, doesn't it? That's most often what we look to. Um, but a dirge is a mournful song, a piece of music, or a poem, often lament for the dead or part of a funeral rite. Okay? So verse 1 tells us that this pronouncement or oracle was given by this pre-exilic uh, prophet uh, Habakkuk. All right, some historic background. The word Habakkuk may derive from a couple of different words. They're really not sure, but one Hebrew mean uh, wor word that, um, that, that Habakkuk comes from could mean uh, embrace. Another one means to rustle. And as we uh, get involved with looking at Habakkuk here, as we go through this, you're going to see that either one could describe his interaction with God. There's some debate as when, uh, to, as when to, uh, Habakkuk ministered in Judah. But more than likely, they are saying it, it happened around 600 B.C., uh, uh, give or take 20 years or so either way. Um, there is uh, some debate um, uh, as, to, uh, as to when it was, but most likely Phil was around 600. And that would put his prophecies about the time of Jehoiakim's uh, reign and therefore would make his contemporaries uh, Jeremiah, uh, Zephaniah or Nahum. So about the same time frame as uh, when Habakkuk uh, was prophesying. Um, the theme, it's unique in that all of his, all of the prophetic books in, in the Old Testament are um, the prophet speaking to the people for God. Did, did, maybe you didn't pick up on that in previous ones, but as you look at it, uh, in all the Old Testament prophets, they are speaking to the people for God, except one prophet, the one we're looking at tonight. He is speaking to God for the people. Very interesting. Um, Habakkuk is divided into two parts. The first part is his dialogue with God regarding uh, some complaints he has. Uh, each complaint is followed by his, God's response. The second um, section is uh, Habakkuk's psalm of confidence in God's grace. Yes, I said psalm of confidence. Now, if you remember earlier, I said that this could have been a dirge, which is more than likely a song, right? We also see in the third uh, chapter Maybe it's in your Bible. If you look at your translation, you might, and you probably will, see in, in dispersed in the third chapter the word, the Hebrew word, selah. Selah. We're not exactly sure what that word means, but various interpretations would include a musical notation. It could mean a pause for silence. It could mean a signal for worshipers to fall prostrate on the ground. It could mean a term for worshipers to, to call out. Or it, some think that it might mean uh, derive or come uh, point to a word meaning forever. But where do we see also, in what book in the Bible do we see the word Selah? Psalms, right? Psalms. So that is why they look to this third chapter in Habakkuk as a psalm, all right? All right. The first thing that Habakkuk raises to God in, in, in our vernacular is, what's up with that, God? What's up with what's going on here? What's up with that? So let's look at his first prayer. It's in the, uh, look, we'll read uh, verses 2 through 4. How long, Lord, must I call for help, and you do not listen, or cry out to you about violence, 
and you do not save? Why do you force me to look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Oppression and violence are right in front of me. Strife is ongoing and conflict escalates. This is why the law is ineffective and justice never emerges. For the wicked restrict the righteous. Therefore, justice comes out perverted. I think if we were all honest with ourselves, Habakkuk's questions to God could be said of us in questioning God. What's up with all this, God? I've been calling out for you for justice, for help. Are you even listening to me, God? Can't you see what's going on around me? Why are you allowing? Why are you tolerating? Why are you ignoring the injustices of my world, the injustices in my life? Our country's been turned upside down and evil people run in our streets, doing violence with no regard to the consequences because there are none. And it's getting worse. Why is the law being perverted to the point that evil is rewarded and good is punished? What's up with that, God? You know, when we look around, that's, that's, what, that's really, that's is my uh, interpretation of what, my translation of what Habakkuk was asking God. But when we look around in our neighborhoods, in our state, our country, in the world, evil acts are ever increasing. Leaders either don't care or what they do flies in the face of what God says is right or true justice. Where is God in all that we see and why isn't he doing something about it? God responds to to Habakkuk's first set of questions, starting with verse 5. Look at the nations and observe. Be utterly astounded, for I am doing something in your days that you will not believe when you hear about it. Look, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter, impetuous nation that marches across the earth's open spaces to seize territories not its own. They are fierce and terrifying. Their views of justice and sovereignty stem from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards and more fierce than wolves of the night. Their horsemen charge ahead. Their horsemen come from distant lands. They fly like eagles, swooping to devour. All of them come to do violence. Their faces are set in determination. They gather prisoners like sand. They mock kings, and rulers are a joke to them. They laugh at every fortress and build siege ramps to capture it. Then they sweep by it like the wind and pass through. They are guilty. Their strength is their God. What is God's answer to Habakkuk? Something's going to happen here. Watch for it, and when you see it, it's going to astound you. And when you hear of it's coming, you're not going to believe it. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? It didn't sound good to Habakkuk. Around the corner were the Chaldeans, the, the Babylonians. They were growing in power and might. And they didn't have a good relationship with Judah. They were not what, what anyone would call a righteous nation. They made their own rules. Their God was themselves and their making. It was the Babylonians who would eventually capture Judah and take her people into exile. This is what Habakkuk was seeing. He was seeing what was happening. Notice in verse 6 that God said he was raising the Chaldeans up. He was doing it. God was going to use them to bring punishment. He acknowledges that they take territory over, that they are fierce, they are terrifying. They don't have the same set of laws that God gave his people. And they come only to wreak havoc and take a lot of prisoners, 
to be used for slaves. They are so powerful, they fear nothing. They mock every king, every country that tries to stand in their way. Why? Because they, they don't, they're not afraid of them. So what is Habakkuk's response then to God? Look at his second prayer, starting with verse 12. Are you not from eternity, Lord my God? My Holy One, you will not die. Lord, you appointed them to execute judgment. My rock, you destined them to punish us. Your eyes are too pure to look upon evil, and you cannot tolerate wrongdoing. So why do you tolerate those who are treacherous? Why are you silent while one who is wicked swallows up one who is more righteous than himself? You have made mankind like the fish of the sea like marine creatures that have no ruler. The Chaldeans pull them all up with a hook, catch them in their dragnet, and gather them in their fishing net. That is why they are glad to rejoice. That is why they sacrifice to their dragnet and burn incense to their fishing net. For by these things their portion, portion is rich and their food is plentiful. Will they therefore empty their net and continually slaughter nations without mercy? Habakkuk is essentially saying, wait, wait a minute, God. Wait, wait a minute. You're Yahweh, right? Aren't you? Now, using the term Yahweh was not casual. It was very intentional. If you've done any study of the Pentateuch, you would understand and know that Yahweh is the most holiest name to address God. In fact, they looked at it as his personal name. So much was that revered that they wouldn't even pronounce the name. In Exodus chapter 3, we read these words. God speaking with Moses, I am who I am, speaking to his eternal nature. This is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am sent me to you. God told Moses, here that he was eternal. He was everlasting to everlasting. Habakkuk is acknowledging the meaning, the significance of the name, and yet he asks, you are destining them to punish us? You're holy. You never die. You appointed them to bring about your justice? Wait a minute, God. You are too pure to even look upon evil, and yet you're using them? To bring justice? Habakkuk then asks God why he is silent while the world is spiraling out of control. Will they continue to fill their empty nets and slaughter nations without mercy? Where are you, God? There must have been silence at least beyond the time it took for God's previous answer because we see that Habakkuk is about to say, okay, I'm going to wait for your action, God. Look at Habakkuk 2.1. I will stand at my guard post and station myself on the lookout tower. I will watch to see what he will say to me and what I should reply about my complaint. It's as if Habakkuk is saying, okay, God, we're waiting. Well then, if you're not going to answer now, I'm going to stand guard and make myself visible so you don't miss me. And just wait till you reply to my questions. And wait till you reply to my observations. Wait till you reply to the complaints that I have. In any event, Habakkuk is determined to patiently wait for God's answer. No matter what his answer is. One of my commentaries that I was looking at said, this patience. There is no more important a passage in Habakkuk than this one regarding waiting. And few in the Old Testament more significant because of the latter use of it by the Apostle Paul and Martin Luther. Habakkuk had to wait on God's response and no one could force, no one could speed up God's answer to what to appear to be an important issue that he wanted answered now. All Habakkuk could do was to stand on the tower Watch and wait for God's response. 
Look at verse Habakkuk 2.2. 2. The Lord answered me. Write down this vision. Clearly inscribe it on the tablet so that no one may easily, or so that one may easily read it. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It testifies about the end and will not lie. Though it delays, wait for it. Since it will certainly come and not be late. Look, his ego is inflated. He is without integrity. But the righteous one will live by his faith. Moreover, wine betrays. An arrogant man is never at rest. He enlarges his appetite like Sheol. And like death, he is never satisfied. He gathers all the nations to himself. He collects all the peoples for himself. God was intentional with his response to Habakkuk. He commanded Habakkuk to write down his vision, inscribe it so that the person carrying the message could easily understand it and read it. Uh, one interpretation or one commentary looked at it. See, it's like God was saying, you know, put it on a billboard so that everybody passing by could see it, like we see along the roadsides, those billboards. God then says, wait. Wait for my appointed time when things will happen according to my plan. The human thing is to expect an immediate response. Now, Lord, I'm going through it now. I want some answers now. Things will happen as revealed, but in God's timing. Isaiah 55, verse 10, 11. For just as rain and snow fall from heaven and do not return there without saturating the earth and making it germinate and sprout and providing seed to sow and food to eat, so my word that comes from my mouth will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I please and will prosper in what I send it to do. Paul and Peter wrote of the same thing regarding patience and waiting on God. Paul wrote in Romans, uh, Romans 9, And what if God, wanting to display His wrath and to make His power known, endured with much patient, patience objects of wrath prepared for destruction? And what if He did this to make known the riches of His glory on objects of mercy that He prepared beforehand His glory for glory? On us, the ones He also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles, excuse me. Peter wrote these words, The Lord does not delay His promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. God's message is this, the righteous will live by faith. Wine betrays, arrogance is never at rest, and then He offers five Woe oracles. Now that's verses 6 through 20 in chapter 2. We're not going to read through those, just in the essence of time. But there are five woes. Woe to the one who exhorts from others. In the end, you are going to pay for your crime. Those who plunder will end up plundering you. Violence always begets violence. When you overrun a nation in power and might with no regard for the people, it will invariably fail. Those who live will feel the violence far more than the dead, and they will look for the day when they can retaliate. Evil always has a way of eating its own. You will reap what you sow. The second woe, woe to the one who is dishonest and then takes the ill-gotten gain to try and live above the peasants, above the frail. That will not last because God is concerned about people. He cares for the needy. He cares for the downtrodden. He cares for those on the lowest rung of society. Woe to those who build cities with bloodshed and injustice. A time is coming when they will See their folly. One day the whole world will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord's glory. One day God will punish the wicked as an answer to Habakkuk's earlier question. 
But God not only punishes evil, but his way will also fill the, the world with his, his knowledge and his glory. Woe to those who get, uh, get neighbors to drink with them. Sinners always look for others to, to join them in their sinful behavior. Babylon was known for its debauchery and drunkenness. And that is what they forced on other nations. But in the end, sinners will be disgraced instead of being filled with glory. The final woe is to those who create false idols and then call upon those idols in times of need. They looked to carved idols. And in the end, what will that idol do for them? What will it do? Nothing. Nothing. The one true God will reign and the whole earth will be silent in his presence. I'm sure Habakkuk now understand, understands what's, what God is saying. God points him back to his demands and questions while he waited for a quick response. Now the, pro, the prophet and the whole world hushes in silence before the Lord. Habakkuk's third prayer. We read about that in Habakkuk 3, verses 1 and 2. Oh boy, where am I going here? I got to catch up. Hang on with me. Bear with me. Here we go. Habakkuk is in awe. Look at verses 1 to 2. A prayer of the prophet Habakkuk, according to that name. I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce it because I'll mess it up. Lord, I have heard the report about you. Lord, I stand in awe of your deeds. Habakkuk remembers God's deeds, all that he's read, that he's seen from the past. He must come to the conclusion that God will continue to work in the coming days. He implores God to work in that day. And he's asking for God to bring about justice. But there's something else that he says. Justice for his own people. Look at verse 2 again. Remember your mercy. Remember your mercy. God's going to carry out his righteous wrath against sin. And he will use the Chaldeans, those Babylonians, against Judah. And so they ask, he asked God, remember your mercy. Don't totally wipe out your people. And then one other thing. We see God's power is unmatched. And he recognizes that in verses 3 through 15. Look, Read, if you will, with me. God comes from Teman, the Holy One of Mount Paran, Selah. There we go, okay? Here's the psalm. His splendor covers the heavens, and the earth is full of his praise. His brilliance is like light. Rays are flashing from his hand. This is where the power is hidden. Plague goes before him, and pestilence follows in his steps. He stands and shakes the earth. He looks and startles the nations. The age-old mountains break apart. The ancient hills sink down. His pathways are ancient. I see the tents of Cushion in distress. The tent curtains of the land of Midian tremble. Are you angry at the rivers, Lord? Is your wrath against the rivers? Or is your fury against the sea when you ride on your horses, your victorious chariot? You took the sheath from your bow. The arrows are ready to be used with an oath. Selah. You split the earth with rivers. Mountains you see and shudder. A downpour of water sweeps by. The deep roars with its voice and lifts its waves high. Sun and moon stand still in their lofty residence. At the flash of your flying arrows, at the brightness of your shining spear, you march across the earth with indignation. You trample down the nations in wrath. You come out to save your people, to save your anointed. You crush the leader of the house of the wicked and strip him from foot to neck. Selah. You pierce his head with his own spears. His warriors storm out to scatter us, gloating as if ready to secretly devour the weak. You tread the sea with your horses, stirring up the vast water. Habakkuk uses some powerful language to describe God's power and what he will ultimately do. He stands above everyone, and on the earth he will carry out his plan. 
Nothing is going to thwart God from carrying out what he has planned to do. And so I want to end this tonight with talking about what Habakkuk now has learned. And we see that in the last few verses in chapter 3. And so as Habakkuk learns, I, I hope that we can see some things in his last few words here of his letter. All right? Look at with me uh, with chapter 3, verses 16 through 19. I heard and I trembled within. My lips quivered at the sound. Rottenness entered my bones. I trembled where I stood. Now I must quietly wait for the day of distress to come against the people invading us. He sees them coming. They're going to come. He can't stop it. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there is no fruit on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though the flocks disappear from the pen, and there are no herds in the stalls, yet I will celebrate in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord, my Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like those of a deer and enables me to walk on the mountain heights. Here's what he learned. Here's what I hope you see in it and you can take with you tonight. Number one, God, only God is God. Only God is God. Okay, I get, I'm going to get caught up again here. Here we go. <laughs> only God is God. All right, here we go. When we are in the midst of difficult things, and I don't know what you're going through right now. Personally, you may be going through some difficult things. I know as a country, we are, we are um, at war with ourselves. The world is in turmoil. When we're in the midst of difficult things and we cry out to God and we don't get answers, and the world allows, around us looks as if God is a wall. And God has abandoned us. We need to remember who God is. He and only He is God. He is our creator. He is our sustainer. He is the only one who has an eternal perspective. We don't. He does. He knows what tomorrow will bring because He has already orchestrated it. He has already made it to happen. He knows what is best. He has the right to choose how to handle each and every situation in our life and in our world. Only He knows how best to bring justice, and only He has the authority and power to do it. God is sovereign and is even able to use human sin and sinful people, sinful governments, for his own purposes. The Babylonians themselves chose to conquer the world. God allowed them to do what they wanted to do, but he used it for his purpose. Just like Joseph, you remember, in Egypt, his brothers came to him, and he said, what you meant for evil... God intended for good and for his glory. God may choose that, that which is evil to administer his wrath, but in the end he will ultimately deal with evil entirely so that it will never, never, ever again be a factor. How long? How long? God requires patience. His justice will take as long as he deems necessary. He has all authority, and we must learn to be patient in the midst of his timetable. Human beings want justice quickly. We want it now according to our timetable. In our minds, God is only just if he acts in ways which we deem are necessary and according to our schedule and what we want done. 
God's justice doesn't always work for every person or every, any, every generation. We may never see God's punishment of evil in our lifetime. You may, not, you may be going through some things and you won't see justice in your life for what's going on. As we look around this world, many times in many ways it seems that evil's winning or at least thriving with no sense of guardrails to curtail what is happening. That doesn't mean that God is not bringing about his justice. It means that justice is his business and he will administer it when he knows it is the right time. Number three, rejoice in him always. As human beings being influenced by culture, we often think of God's approval for, of our lives uh, when we have peace, when he's blessed us with health, with long life, with prosperity. That's when we think that, that, that uh, uh, God approves of us. That's being taught in churches, and it's, I believe that is straight from the pits of hell. Scripture does not teach that. Habakkuk, we've just read about it. God was telling Habakkuk, you're going to go through these things, but guess what? I am right, and I will do what I'm going to do. Habakkuk concludes that though hardships come, to know God more fully, sometimes hardships, God allows them to happen in our lives. The human nature is when things are going good, guess what? God's the first thing from our minds. When we go through the difficult things in life, that's when he speaks to us. That's when he touches us. That's when he helps us grow to be more in conformance with Christ. We also need to know that when we're living the good life, or what we call the good life, we tend to begin rejoicing in God's blessings rather than rejoicing in Him. Rejoicing in Him for who He is, for how He loved us in spite of our sin, and He called us to be part of Him, His family. Habakkuk ended his oracle with, promising, with praising God in worship, using familiar music and practices of praise. Singing praise and worship to God brings out the human emotion to the forefront in, in dealing with God. It helps the human spirit to focus on God, interacting with the Spirit of God. In spite of what Habakkuk and the people were experiencing and what they saw coming to them in God's judgment, open worship helped them in focusing on God and who He is. God is a sovereign God. That means that everything we experience in life is according to His plan. In all things, God wants to use it for His glory and our growth in Him. So when we understand that, our attention should turn to rejoicing in God, not asking why, but asking what. What do you want me to do in this situation I find myself in? How can I best glorify you? It will be God-sized. Okay? What he asks you to do will be God-sized. So the final thing that I want to share that I believe that Habakkuk learned is that God will give you strength to see whatever you're going through to its completion. He'll give you the strength. If God is sovereign, and if all things happen for a purpose, and the main purpose is to glorify Him, then God will give you strength to get through anything in life because He will be glorified. He won't put you in a situation or allow difficulties or struggles or pain or suffering or anything else without giving you what you need to get through what he has allowed to happen in your life or what he has brought into your life, he'll give you what you need that you might get through it and glorify him in the process. 
God will sustain you. Rejoice in that. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your, your word. And, and this was just an overview, Lord. I know that uh, really we could break down this, this book and what and how you dealt with this prophet. I mean, we could really spend uh, two or three nights. But I hope and pray, Lord, that as the last half hour or so, that as we overlook and we see what, what Habakkuk was asking and the complaints that he had and how you responded, you show yourself to be God. And that the difficulties we go through in life are according to your plan. And you want us to respond in such a way, sometimes just to wait for an answer, to be patient. But God, I would, help, I would pray that you would help us to, to, to respond and to act with what we're going through in a way that would bring glory to you. No matter what that might mean. Because God, you love us so much. You're more concerned about our character and who we are than you, than our comfort. And sometimes you allow some uncomfortable, difficult things to happen in our lives. But you want to use it to help us to grow in our relationship with you and to bring you glory. I thank you, God, for that. You don't allow things to happen in our lives which mean nothing. Pain and suffering is, is for nothing. You have a purpose and a plan, Lord. So as we leave this place, Lord, may we seek your face in all that we say and do. May we, uh, we strive to live for you. And as, as things come into our lives, as we look around in our world, we see um, evil seemingly prevailing. May we praise you for the God that you are, and your love for us and your love for people. May we, pro may we proclaim that to the world and allow you to do what you're going to do in the time that you're going to do it. Thank you, God, for loving us. Walk with us now, Lord, as we leave this place. Keep us safe until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen.